the Not In Our Town Board who are here, if you would stand up or raise your hand so that people can see who you are. If you have questions okay. about the organization, okay. these are the folks to talk to. Uh, as Kim said, normally on the first Monday of the month, uh, you'd come in. Those of you who are regulars know we would be seated in circles. And, uh, but tonight we are very, very privileged to have a special guest for you, which my colleague Simone Burgess will introduce in a moment. I just have a couple of pieces of information I wanted to share with you beforehand. Uh, later in the year, in March, an organization called Beyond Diversity, which does some really spectacular training, is holding a four-day institute called LBGTQ Oppression and Human Sexuality. The flyers are at the back, if you're interested. And then, even closer and even sooner, this Thursday, also picking up on the theme of racial literacy, is a group in West Windsor. And this Thursday will be the first of three sessions panel discussions and other information will be given at uh, the West Windsor Public Library. And the person to speak to about that is Connie Alongoven. Connie, are you here? I okay. That's Connie. If you have questions, she's the person to speak to. And now I'd like to introduce Simona Burgers, uh, who without her, we would not have this. <laughs> she, she contacts everybody. I said, really? <laughs> you really, you just contacted him? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so here she is. Always embarrassing me. I wonder why. <laughs> good evening, good evening. I am honored. I contacted Dr. Stevenson last October, and he graciously accepted to come speak to us tonight. Dr. Howard Stevenson is a constant Clayton professor of urban education, professor of Africana studies, and former chair of Allied Psychology and Human Development Division in the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania. From 1994 to 2002, he was faculty master of the W.B. Du Bois College House in Penn. In 1993, Dr. Stevenson received a W.T. Grant Foundation Faculty Scholar Award, a National Research Award given only five researchers per year, which funds research for five years. His passion and interest. He is the director, he is the executive director of the Racial Empowerment Collaborative, REC, a research program development and training center that brings together community leaders, researchers, authority figures, families, and youth to study and promote racial literacy and health in schools and neighborhoods. Please put your hands together to welcome Dr. Steve. Thank you very much, um, Simona. I appreciate. Microphone. Yes, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. All right, good. Um, it is a pleasure and honor to be here tonight. I'm hoping we will get a lot of interaction. I'm, I'm, I'm trained to, to speak for four hours straight <laughs> as a lecturer, a pastor um, of a lot of things. Um, but I rather have interaction. A lot of our discussions around race tend to be ideological, tend to be around rationality, what we believe. And I would rather turn it into, what are you going to do if you only have a minute? If you only had a minute to make a decision, what, what would you do that reflected your beliefs, reflected your values? in a way that you could walk away feeling proud of how you acted, not sheepish or weak because you didn't speak your voice or your mind. And we're going to start with stories, and stories I always tell. Um, and I'm going to ask you to tell a story uh, within a couple of minutes with someone next to you, and take notes on yourself. Um, racial literacy defined for us and for me and the work that we're doing is the ability to read, recast, and resolve racially stressful encounters. Now, what is a racially stressful encounter? A racially stressful encounter is any time you're in a moment where you want to speak or say something and you feel tongue-tied, overwhelmed, um, stuck. Sometimes you have the best ideas in your head, but you can't get them to your mouth. 
And sometimes you're absolutely surprised that the things that actually came out of your mouth had nothing to do with what you were thinking. <laughs> that ever happened to you? Particularly in racial moments, people get overwhelmed. Um, in some respects, um, we want to do something about that. We, wanna, we also want to stop the kinds of verbal and emotional assaults on young children, teenagers, families of color in this country. Whether it's in the school setting, on a playground, in the hallways between classes, that influence how well they learn, whether they can focus, that affects their health. If I make an argument to you about the importance of racial relations, just on the notions of ideology and being good people, I don't think it's strong enough. I don't think it's powerful enough. Because I don't think our ideas or our values are enough for us to take risks that we need to take to make changes in our relationships with people, not only those who are strangers, but people we actually care about. So um, part of the idea in the work that we're doing called the Racial Empowerment Collaborative is that we're looking at how do we empower a voice through research, intervention, and training. And we're focusing on what do you do in the moment, right now, um, face to face, and do we consider the different styles in which people go about their understanding of the world, their ways of being in the world, identity. So style and movement matter. Some people misinterpret style. They misinterpret movement when it doesn't come in a cultural frame that they are accustomed to. And we worry about that. And we want to know if in all of the relationships, whether they're teacher, student, parent, child, community to school, are these elements of affection, protection, correction, and connection visible, observable, um, that both sides are understanding that's occurring. It can be reciprocal. And my concern is, in some of the places we have been in schools around the country, that there's a lot more correction as punishment as opposed to correction as accountability, um, and no level of affection, protection, or connection. Affection is nurturing. To what degree do I feel the leaders, the teachers, the folks, the adults in that setting care about me? Not only emotionally, but physically. Not only emotionally and physically, but culturally. Do they appreciate my difference? Do they have a a nurturing sense of my difference, where I don't have to hide it. I don't have to pretend that I'm somebody else just to make you feel good. Right? So there's, a, there's an element of emotional, physical, and cultural uh, nurturance for, and protection and correction and connection that we want to see. We want to be able to count, observe. Not an idea, not a wish I should have, could have, would have, but do I feel that you care? Right? Do I know that you care? Do I know that you're watching over me with the best sense of humanity in those moments that you're watching over me? Right? We have been at different places around the country. The Bronx police was the most difficult conversation I've had. And I felt like in three hours, it was a setup meeting. Um, the only time I was able to get the police to begin to feel this affection, connection, correction, was when we asked them the simple question of, what would you do if your own child came home running away from police, worrying to tell you that they were being harassed? What would you do? What would you say? And then we got stories. Then we got people to share a little bit more about what stress it's like if I'm a parent of a child who has to navigate those issues. So that's the work we're doing. If you look at some of the work out of Southern Poverty Law Center, you'll see that since the election, there have been an incredible amount of hate, not only speech, uh, speaking, but hate attacks on those who are different. In just the first month, over 1,000 reports. And many of these happening around schools uh, and in the context of children. So we're interested in children's perspectives on these moments, right? We're interested in how children navigate 
these moments. And the area of research I've been studying for a long time, maybe too long, is called racial socialization. That is, does it matter that your parents give you feedback on how to navigate racial conflict or racial uplift? Does it matter? Does it matter in terms of your achievement academically? Does it matter in terms of your uh, coping? Does it matter in your well-being, your health, anger, and depression? And what we've learned is it is absolutely a protective factor, that the more I get feedback about how to navigate a racial elephant in the room, where I feel tongue-tied, overwhelmed, not being able to access my skills, getting that feedback is helpful because it reduces my stress. And if I can reduce my stress, I can think better. And if I can think better, I can see better. And I don't have to make a snap judgment just because I'm afraid. And young people say, I've seen this before. This is an elephant I've seen before. It smells like an elephant. It acts like an elephant. And my mother and father told me exactly what to do. Now what we've learned in that research over 25 years is that it used to be general statements of racial support or racial coping are significantly related to positive outcomes of anger management and depression management mm -hmm. and academic achievement. But I've never thought of it as direct. I think it's indirect. And then the indirect connection between talking about race and your children doing well is not, it's not direct. It has to move through something. And that something it moves through is this sense of stress. That when I'm in that racially stressful encounter, I get overwhelmed. But because they gave me feedback, they gave me some understanding of what that overwhelm was about. And so maybe I can think, decide in the process. Now, that early research was interested in making the connection, positive connection. I'm not interested in it anymore. I think it's already protective to talk to children about race. I don't want to prove that anymore. <laughs> what I'm trying to do is to say, how do we make it better? How do we enhance it? So instead of saying being proud to be black, be proud to be Pakistani, be proud to be Mexican. I'm interested in the next time somebody calls you the N-word, I want you to do one, two, three, four. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The more explicit, the less confusion I have on what to do, the more I can make decisions that are in my best interest in that moment. It's not about blame. Not trying to make people feel guilty. It's about how well do we navigate these moments. So if you look at some of the work we're doing real quickly, we're doing basketball interventions on playgrounds. We're training African-American barbers to provide counseling to uh, African-American men between ages 18 and 24 while they're getting their hair cut. I don't know how many of you have been to a black barber shop or seen one on television. A lot can go on in a black barber shop. A lot of personal things can be shared. So we've actually trained the barbers who are, they're like mini um, neighborhood superheroes that nobody knows about, can drop a lot of wisdom in a 30 minute hair moment, hair cutting moment. Um, the brothers in this case will tell stories they won't tell a pastor or a partner. They share some very personal things. And men are prepared in our work to, to give them feedback. Um, we're interested in a racial literacy magazine for children like Highlights you see in dentist offices. We have a program in which we are actually teaching families how to talk to their children about race, called Embrace, by one of my postdocs. And there are a host of other things. And, but all of them are going to include the strategies we're going to talk about today, in the moment, face to face. So the first rule is going to get emotional, I hope, tonight. And I hope to stress you out, <laughs> in a positive way, of course. Um, emotion is not just a good thing, though. It's a Jedi Knight good thing. And I, and I apologize to anybody who never wanted to become a Jedi Knight. But the reason it's Jedi Knight-like is because you if you're able to figure out what's going on with you in that stressful minute or moment, you have a leg up on those who are absolutely overwhelmed. Right? Absolutely overwhelmed. Two, we, we want to do something that we call courageous noticing. That is, 
the ability to notice what's going on with you while you're being you in this particular moment. Saving the world, very interesting. Saving black and brown people, even more interesting, but not as good as courageous noticing, if you ask me. Because I think one of the biggest challenges is in these moments, people don't <coughs> notice themselves and they are afraid and they make decisions they regret later on. Or they make decisions that are in the best interests of those they're in front of. So a colleague of mine, uh, Joan Edwards at uh, Kingswood Oxford, ta talked about this word courageous noticing and it reflected what I'm going to ask you to do tonight. And that's admitting to what's going on with me right here, right now. Not about blame, but about the idea, of, can I see myself be myself? And that is defined for us as courage. Courage is really seeing yourself. Um, you'll feel the urge to hide or run away. Don't stray into the future. Stay in the present. We're going to ask you to calculate, locate, communicate, breathe, and exhale. I'll explain more later. Through the stress that you might feel. Don't take a break. And I say to people now, I believe in you enough to challenge you because for 10 years at being at Penn, I've been there 25 years. I was 10 when I started, just to let you know. <laughs> and uh, in the process, I was very supportive to my colleagues, many of my white colleagues, because I really hoped that they would respond to that support, take more risk in the area of race and difference, and we could partner together, we could write together. What a stupid idea that was. <laughs> And part of that is because I didn't understand the fear. I didn't understand the level of stress they were going through to actually take the kind of risks. Mm -hmm. I knew more about their work than they knew about mine. Yeah. Have you ever been in a relationship with somebody where you're always wondering whether they really, really do care about you? Like, <laughs> does he, does he not, does she, does she not? There's a, it wears on the nerves over, over time. So now I just piss people off. <laughs> because I say to them, I believe in you enough I believe enough to challenge you because I'm not sure safety and security is enough to push you to a place where you're going to be risk taking. And I think in, in good relationships, conflict deepens in, intimacy, deepens uh, risk taking. Um, but but you've got to step up your game. You can't just you know, be safe. And finally, um, it's going to be emotion. So when you see this image, just yell out, pretend you're home. What do you, what comes to your mind when you see this image? We're going to do this very quickly. And I see Courtney Portlock back there. How are you doing? Hi. Good to see you. What comes to mind? Viewpoint. Say it again? Viewpoint. Viewpoint. Thank you. Perspective. Perspective. Right. What else? You don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. Excellent. Judgment. Say it again? Judgment. Judgment. What else? Confusion. 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 What else? Ignorance. Ignorance. Okay. Where's Great. the black person? Yeah, Where's the black person? <laughs> okay. So Courtney knows I've been doing this a long time. I haven't yet got a good graphic that's multicultural. <laughs> so I, got, I still have to work on that. I'm just always talking. That's the problem. Um, but you're right. You did see it. But that wasn't, I wasn't trying for that. Sure. <laughs> Another day I'm trying. Okay, some people don't see the blindfolds. How many people, honestly, you didn't see the blindfolds? Truth and honesty, just be real. Yeah, very good. All right, so you can be staring at something for a minute and still not see what's going on. That makes sense? Okay. All right, you told me what you think. Anybody tell me what you feel when you look at this? What do you feel? I get it. Hmm? I get it. You get it? Okay, what feeling is that? Understanding. Understanding. Okay. All right. Overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. Okay. Somebody else. Yes. I don't know why they don't take their blindfolds off. Okay. And what feeling would that reflect? You say. I feel a little bit uh, judgmental, like they're kind of being ridiculous. Okay. Wow. Uh, you're judgmental. How about yeah. piss? No, <laughs> piss doesn't. <laughs> piss I don't know if I feel pissed because okay. nobody's getting hurt. Okay. Okay. All right. Just take it off. Yeah, take it off. <laughs> frustrated? Maybe frustrated? Frustrated. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, so for the next little bit of time we have, I'm going to not just ask you what you think. I'm going to push you to tell me what you feel. Because many of us are good at rationality. We're not as good 
around this issue of what am I feeling in a particular moment? Would you define fe feel for all of us? Here sure. My definition of feeling? Wow, that's a deep question. <laughs> Seven twenty at night. Um, I, I, I think. Um, all right. Let me let me try another way. Um, I'm going to ask you to calculate, locate, and communicate. And, that, and calculate, I'm going to ask you, what feeling are you having right now on a scale of 1 to 10? So for me, a feeling is what emotion comes up at this point in time. It can be any emotion. It doesn't have to be negative. Doesn't, it doesn't have to be positive. You just try to find it. One way to find it is giving me a level. How intense is that emotion? Sometimes we get to intensity before we can label what the emotion is. Calculate is, I mean, uh, locate is where in my body do I feel it? So another way to look at emotion is, do I locate it anywhere? Is it particularly, like my right leg is shaking. So you can say, I have a feeling, and it's happening in my right leg. And then uh, self-talk or communicate is, what am I saying to myself in this particular moment? Like, you're an idiot, why are you talking in front of all these people, or whatever. That is very important. So emotion, it's a good question in a sense. But um, I want it to be spontaneous, OK? Um, all right, so in a sense, most of you got this notion of perspective. But in our work, we take a both-hand sort of view. Not only are these folks blinded, but they're also sighted. They see something. They've discovered something. They're both discovering and blind. They're both sighted and blind. And we try to take sort of that approach on a lot of problem solving around difference. Some of us are brilliant at some things and idiotic at others, right? Some of us are fast and slow. Some of us are liberal, conservative. But I would argue that we're kind of a combination in some respects. And that combination, what some would think of as a both hand, is better reflective of who we are, in a sense. Either or is a bit more struggle, a bit more of a struggle to navigate. There's also this other issue in this. Uh, picture around stress that most people don't get. Um, if I said to you um, that on a scale of 1 to 10, that most people would be, the person who found a snake would be significantly more stressed than the person who found a rope. How many of you would agree with me? Let's just say a snake rode up in here in the Princeton <laughs> Library right now, just came down the aisle. How many of you would be at a 7 or above in terms of intensity? Now, how many of you be at a three or below? OK, have you ever worked with snakes? Have you touched snakes before? You're a biology professor somewhere? What do you do? Uh, I work in administration, but I love nature. All right, so you know, she's having exposure to snakes. She's had exposure to snakes. So that's why. So she doesn't count, really, <laughs> for the rest of us who are deathly afraid of snakes. So one way to explain. Uh, the issue of that minute, that racially stressful encounter. Some people see that moment as a three. And other people see it as a snake, as a nine or a ten. And when you're at a nine or a ten, your brain goes on lockdown. Your decisions are really, uh, they suck at that point. <laughs> and in many respects, we don't account for in our ways of understanding how doesn't matter how knowledgeable we are. It depends on, are we prepared for that moment in which we're going to make a decision that could affect somebody else's life? So some of the assumptions we make is that the symbols around race in our society are important, but they may have lessened important over the years because they don't always trickle down to face to face. And so encounters is more of an issue we stress about. What do you do in a moment? What do I believe? I believe in justice. Believing in social justice is not the same as Will I be just if I only have a minute? When my 12-year-old boy is in front of you, who's black and brown, and he stresses you out, will you be able to navigate that moment and access the skills that you have as an educator, as a police officer? I want our police officers to courageously notice themselves. I want our educators to courageously notice themselves. I want our parents to do the same thing. I want their friends and colleagues so they don't make crazy symbols. So encounters, not symbols, are, are as important in, in our work. Secondly, there are all kinds of stressors. Some of us are excellent at navigating stress and managing stress in some areas, but not in racial areas. <coughs> in working with folks in prisons, 
as well as therapists who are used to anger and restraining adults can still get tongue-tied in a racially stressful encounter, overwhelmed. So the idea is that you must practice for the context in which you, you become skilled uh, around a stressor. And just being great at um, swimming doesn't make you a great water polo player, even though uh, water polo requires swimming to some degree. Um, we're focusing on competence more than character. A lot of people come to racial discussions around goodness, that good people don't do race, racist things. And I, I would say that none of us apply that same sort of um, theory to teaching math or teaching algebra. We don't hire algebra teachers because they're good people. I want a moral algebra teacher. No, you want somebody who knows how to teach algebra and has done it for a while. And we need to do the same around racial moments in navigating. I want somebody who's competent. Their goodness, their badness, their racist, their personality is secondary, if not tertiary, to whether they know how to navigate that moment. Um, I think schools are contexts in which we learn how to avoid, since we're not talking much about race, because it's, it's obviously and understandably scary. What if people think I'm a racist? What if people think I'm a sell out? What if they see that I'm not sure? What if I say the wrong thing and I get diagnosed and labeled? Those fears are understandable. But over time, when people are learning how to avoid racial coping, which by the way, reduces stress. So one benefit of avoidance is that it reduces the same stress that telling your children, here's what I want you to do, also reduces. The question is it makes you ineffective in navigating these encounters. And I would argue not only ineffective, but, but also incompetent. And not only incompetent, but unethical and unprofessional. And that's not being a bad person. It's not, being, um, it's not an issue to blame. It's an issue around learning and knowledge, right? And people will feel guilty. They will feel angry. It's absolutely part of humanity. Those are just not useful strategies to problem solve. Anger and guilt, normal, but not useful for problem solving. Okay, so, and finally, I feel very hopeful about us resolving racial stress. Now, curing systemic discrimination, if you go to sleep most nights hoping to have cured systemic discrimination, you're probably depressed most nights, <laughs> right? Stress is more observable. You can feel it, you can see it in other people. You can see it in yourself, right? You can speak to it if you have this, the practice. So the theory around racial socialization is that it reduces the stress in racially stressful encounters so that people can engage those racial elephants, those moments, with a bit more agency, assertiveness, voice, history, legacy, right? And so um, and, and it, the only thing is it takes practice. And I know some of you are saying, practice, practice. We're talking about practice? <laughs> Anybody know Alan Arvison? Anybody know? One guy in the back. That doesn't make any sense. You guys are this close to Philly. Anyway. Um, so I tell people practicing, storytelling is a way to practice. Right? And, and one way to tell a story about a racial experience is to go back in a time that you remember. And the first story I'm going to ask you to tell has to do with what kind of messages or socialization did you get while you were growing up? Now, the story I tell includes that, and it begins with being in a two-parent, a, a multicultural family with two parents, both who were African-American, but um, were as different from each other as East is from West. They didn't celebrate holidays the same way. They didn't really agree on a whole lot. They have very different political views about how you should engage political, racial conflict. My father's particular way um, in dealing with racial conflict, because he had us in church 24 hours a day, seven days a week, was that you pray for people when you have a moment with the hope that God would get them back in the end. We were not sure when the end was going to be. Some days we prayed to God for the end. <laughs> but his idea is that you don't sully yourself 
with the day-to-day -day activities. These are spiritual issues. These are warfare issues that you don't have but so much influence, so you pray. Um, I grew up in a community from his neighborhood in which people don't care how many degrees I have. I thank you for that introduction, Simona, but they don't really care. What they care about when you go home, I don't know if you grew up, anybody here heard of Delaware, by the way? <laughs> Southern Delaware is where I grew up. Anybody from Southern Delaware? You drove through once and you kept on going. <laughs> My family started in Delaware. Okay. Southern Delaware? Uh, Wilmington. Yes, okay. So there are two Delawares, just to let you know. There's Southern and people in Upper Delaware look at people in Lower Delaware as Slower Delaware. Has anybody heard that? Okay, see. So uh, I tell people the same thing all the time, that um, bell bottoms just showed up in Delaware a couple months ago. <laughs> And it's one of those fashions that are never coming back, I don't believe, ever. Um, it's like the South, it's like Mississippi, the culture, the language is different. Um, in high school when we won the basketball championship, you would have thought we won the Civil War because we beat the Northerners, you know, in Wilmington. Um, so when I go back, those folks, they don't really care how much education, they care about, do you remember us? Do you remember how we raised you, even though we didn't always get through school, right? And I'm the oldest of three. My brother is a famous lawyer. He wrote a book called Just Mercy. And my sister, Christy, is a musician. And uh, we all have the same rules when we go back. We have to speak to people, right? You can't just walk by somebody and not speak to them because that means you have disregarded their contribution to you in your life. And that's, a, that's an evil thing to do. That's not healthy. And then your family didn't raise you right. One day I went back to the supermarket in Georgetown, Delaware, and I was rushing to get stuff for my father. And I rushed so much in my city five ways that I passed by the praying lady from my church, Ms. Warrington. Now, in my church, everybody prays. And if you know, you've been to a church, black church, everybody prays. But there's some people who know how to really pray. They somehow can get God quicker. Um, thunder and lightning comes for them. The rest of us pray, but they really know how to pray. Mrs. Warrington was that person. She was demure in public, but when she kneeled down, stuff was going to happen. That's how she was. So I missed her. I didn't see her. And as, and as I got the food, on my way home, she called my father and she said, Hobby, there's something wrong with your boy. That's his nickname. He didn't speak to me. So my father, as soon as I walked in, he said, what did you do? I said, uh, I got your stuff. I got what you wanted. Everything's cool. He said, no, you didn't speak to Ms. Warrington. I said, ah, OK. So I had to call Ms. Warrington up. I had to apologize. And I had to say, listen to her talk about local issues like prayer life in Georgetown, Delaware, for 20 minutes. Anybody come from a neighborhood like that? Well, that's where I come from. They don't care how many degrees I have. Some people will even say to me, look, when are you graduating? When are you getting out of school? We're trying to need some help, right? So that's my father's side. My mother's side, not Martin Luther Kingish at all, more Malcolm X. She's from North Philly. Anybody from North Philly? Heard of North Philly? All right. North Philly has a certain way about it, right? There's an attitude. My mother came to Southern Delaware. She thought she went to a foreign country. She didn't understand. She didn't understand the black people, the migrant people, the native people, because they were deferential in the presence of whites. My mother was not deferential. She wanted to go somewhere. She walked. She didn't really, <laughs> she didn't really care what you thought. Before we get into a store, she said, don't ask for nothing. Don't touch nothing. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? I don't care if all the other kids are climbing the walls. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Okay, anybody ever give, give that talk? Anybody ever give that talk? Anybody ever give that talk this morning? When trying to get to school. So why does a parent give that talk? Just yell out. Protection. Don't want to be embarrassed. Don't want to be embarrassed. Don't want to be arrested. Yes. Yes. Say that again. Keep you safe. Absolutely. My mother was not worried about us misbehaving. 
since we were in church 24 hours, seven times a day, we were too scared to act up. You know, we were afraid. I was always afraid my first sexual experience, my whole church would show up right in the middle of it. And uh, you know, the praying lady would come out and start praying. The choir would start singing, you know, Oh Happy Day or How I Got Over, you know. Anyway. I could not stand that image. And so basically, uh, we didn't do anything wrong. She wasn't worried about us doing anything wrong. She was worried about how other people would misperceive us, right? And we know that happens. And we know that some parents do not have to worry about their children coming home from public places. They're not, they're not worried about them walking home from the library, right? And that's not about blame. That's just about we live in different worlds, even if we live in the same neighborhood. Right? At, this, at the National Institute of Health, we're working on parenting, and we know that some of our researchers still haven't gotten the message that parents parent according to the dangers they fear their children will face. So, not everybody has to worry that police will see my child at 12 years old as a problem, as an enemy, as a snake. And in that regard, we parent differently. We are stressed differently, not about the blame. If you are a parent of a, of, a, of a girl who is a early mature, you think differently about how the world will see her. You might say some things to her that you might not say to the other daughters, right? Because other people are going to see them older, and that's a different world. It's not wrong. It's just different. So we're in the supermarket, and we are stressed because we don't want no drama. We just want to get our food, eat, go home. Some days that happens. Some days it doesn't. You can feel the stress. We're looking at the looks of the people, looking at our mother with her way, and we are stressed. So we try to distract her by counting up all the food in the shopping cart. Some days at work, she looked at her children and said, they're so smart. She didn't even see the looks, and there was no drama. But some days that didn't work. Maybe God was busy with some other kids in another town, <laughs> another supermarket. So we did what our father taught us to do, which was to pray. Lord, please don't let nothing happen in the supermarket today. Some days that worked, some days it didn't work. And nothing we could do could stop the conflict that was about to happen. That encounter at the end of the conveyor belt where the person would have to do something or say something to put her in her place, put us in our place. The worst thing they could do was to throw my mother's food into the bag. And then it was on. She began to tell them who they were, who their family was, where to go, how fast to get there. <laughs> Anybody here been cursed out? Okay. Well, it take my mother about 20 seconds. The person would be on the floor writhing in pain and utter decay. We just, we try to warn them, you know, Brian and Chris would say, you probably don't want to do that, but <laughs> no, wouldn't matter. That moment was over. Now, that's my story. That's part of my story. If you talk and listen to my brother, he'll have some element of that story, too. The moral of the story uh, for me is sometimes when it comes to racial moments, you have to pray, ponder, think through, process. But other times you have to know how to push, say something, speak up, not be quiet. And I would argue that those are skill sets that we don't have, that we don't do very well. We're less skilled in navigating pondering racial moments or speaking up in a just way in those moments. So I'm asking you now to think about what messages did you get while you were children, if you can remember, or moments that came up to you. And you have two minutes to talk to your person next to you about them. The kicker is I want you to take notes on yourself to calculate, locate, communicate, that is, how intense is the feeling? What feeling is it? How intense? Where in my body do I feel it? And am I talking to myself while I'm telling the story or listening to my partner's story? You got that? Mm -hmm. All right. Ready? Two minutes. Go. And then in two minutes, I'll yell, switch, and then your partner will go. <laughs> go for it. <laughs>
switch. Switch. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. If we have time, we can do another. Thank you. Let's start again. Thank you very much. See, I have two. All right. So, your task is to practice. This is the first Jedi Knight skill, is to notice yourself. It takes courage. Saving the world, eh. Noticing what's going on with you in a moment, courageous. Sure. Courageous to notice yourself. So did you notice anything about yourself while you were talking or listening to your partner? Yes? One thing, it was all so pleasant until he said the word niggers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In your story? Yes, so what feeling did you have? Oh, I'm sorry, your partner, you're talking about your partner. Yeah, my partner. He, well, I was smiling and laughing with him, and then he was telling me about when they used to say, and them niggers, I got <laughs> Okay, so what did you Nine notice about... Now. Growing up in the city, uh, in the Bronx. Yes. But it wasn't a put down, it was just a, a label. Okay, absolutely. They said they were all on an equal plane, they had names for each other. Yeah. Excellent, so you're telling me about the story, right? Yeah. I want to know about you. <laughs> so, yeah, what did you notice about yourself in that moment? I noticed I was fine listening to him. Yes. It was story time. Yes. But when he got to that one word... What happened to you? <laughs> I got a little serious. Okay. What feeling would you say serious falls under? What do you mean? You got serious. On a scale of 1 to 10, how like serious? humorously. Yes. But now I'm listening seriously. Okay. <laughs> so on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being very seriously and 1 being not seriously at all, what number would you pick? 8. 8. Did, did you feel it anywhere in your body? Uh, it was up here. In your head? Yeah. In your whole head or the right side of your head? <laughs> your left side? Okay. What was happening in the left side? Need a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> you do comedy on the weekends? Or you know, I just, all right, let me. Somebody else, did you notice anything about yourself? Well, give his reaction. Oh, I'll, I'll, come, I'll come back. I'll come back, all right? Think about it, yes. I noticed that when I had to tell my story, I was smiling a lot. Like, Yes. Okay, like I'm trying to make it seem a little more lighthearted than mm -hmm. the situation was. Okay. Mm. Tried to interject like humor into it so that it didn't seem like grave seriousness. Okay. Uh, so what feeling would you describe you having at that point? Not really anxiety, but mm -hmm. like the need to make things seem okay. Yes. I can't find a word for that. Absolutely. Um, the need to, to make things seem okay. I think that's pretty good. And on a scale of 1 to 10, how much of that did you feel you were having? Probably like a 6. 6. Okay. And did you feel it anywhere in your body? Kind of fell under my legs because I always shake my legs when I'm a little nervous. Okay. Both legs? Or? Yeah, both legs. Okay. And were you saying anything to yourself while this was happening? Tone it down. <laughs> okay. Tone what down, though? seriousness. Okay. I really didn't want it to come across as like such a grave matter. Yes. Because when, when something like that, when something mm -hmm. happens to you and you have to speak up for, against injustice and then you talk about it after, you're trying to comfort yourself. You might want to make it seem like less of a big deal. Right. So yes. my way of coping is kind of just to make it a joke. Yes. Very natural. Very honest. appreciate that. Um, and part of the idea is, can we get folks to a place where they can still be all of who they are in that moment? They don't have to cover that up. But knowing how you did it is absolutely fantastic. Somebody else, did you know anything about yourself while you were talking or listening to your partner? Yeah, yeah I could. I'm trying to do mic to make it easier. 
as I told my story, I, I, I said the reason I grew up in Brooklyn, I was told to be very aware of mm -hmm. where I am all the time. And how, uh, when I went to school and being a child, I was supposed to be very aware and, and always be aware of my surroundings. And my partner was saying she grew up in Trenton, and she knows as we walk to school, like, everything's cool, everything's fine. And I was, you know, when she said that, I was like, I can't believe you grew up that way. Because <laughs> I was always, always worried about what could jump off where, where I was. Mm -hmm. And so what feeling did you have while you were telling that part of the story? When I, when I told my story? Mm -hmm. But that's the way life is, that basically you should always be aware. Mm -hmm. uh, no matter what, whether you're a small child or an adult, about things that can happen, mm -hmm. essentially. And that was my normal, basically. Mm -hmm. Still my normal. And as you were telling the story, did you have a certain feeling trying to communicate that perspective? Was there a feeling in your body while you were telling that story? My heart was pounding. Like when you mentioned the people from North Philly, I know the people from North Philly. They were more like people. Mm -hmm. They were always ready. You know, no matter what, whatever's going to go down, they're ready for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I grew up you know, being ready for stuff. Sure. So I think it's so interesting that you were able to live a life where that wasn't part of who you right. were. And while you were telling the story, do you remember those moments of being on guard? Absolutely. Did images come to your mind by any chance? Yeah, being chased for, uh, from school when I was in elementary school because this kid wanted to beat me up and my mm -hmm. brother saved me. He just showed up out of the blue with mm -hmm. a long arm and he just stopped those kids from bothering me. And I was right. like, boy, my brother was always my hero anyway. So yes. He saved my life that day, literally. He saved Beautiful. my life. And did you say anything to yourself while you were telling this story and trying to communicate your perspective? Just be honest about it. And, mm -hmm. you know, and that's my truth. Excellent. That's Excellent. Um, can we have a round of applause for the people who spoke <laughs> and took the time to speak? Um, to me, that's courageous to be able to share that. It's not easy. You can hear in people's voices it's not easy. Yeah. This happens in a minute. Two minutes. I'm going to come back to you. Yes? This is a little bit off, but just a reaction. I was at a repast. No, I was still at the funeral mm -hmm. yesterday. Whatever. Yesterday or the day before. And I got there late, so I didn't get a program of whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. I just want to show. So I went over to the man that was standing there that had one. And I went like this to ask him, could I see where the thing was. Mm -hmm. He jumped back like he was ready to fight. And it was like, <laughs> so I thought to myself, this man must have grown up in a place where he's used to being attacked or something, or somebody snatching something from him, because we had a funeral. And uh -huh. why would he act like that? I just wanted to look at his Perhaps. Yeah. program. Perhaps. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Did you want to comment on your part of the story? I was a poor Irish boy who went to the Harvard is from the Bronx to Harvard, and I was with some fellow freshmen, one of whom was the son of a, a senator from Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned the fact that I was going to go to the St. Paul's Church, and he looked at me and says, "You're a Catholic." Mm -hmm. and I, I didn't know what to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't think of myself as a Catholic. I right. Someone who went to church. Right. <laughs> And did, how did you feel about that? What was your feeling? Uh, I was shocked. That was. Uh, mm -hmm. I, 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 we were both in an ROTC and mm -hmm. together, and I guess eventually he stepped away from it. I don't know. Was it offensive to you in any way? No, except for that, which was a put down. Okay. And I'm somehow inferior to everybody else mm -hmm. because I go. <laughs> Okay, and on a scale. I've never experienced that in New York City. Yes. I worked or something like that. Did you walk away feeling like, I wish I could have said something to him at that time? I wish I could have. Would you could have responded to that moment differently? Just something you wanted to say. No, I, 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 I thought about it. I guess I wanted to say something. I think maybe later on I did talk about it, saying, I think I did say I was really annoyed at what you said. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So you, I you do it spontaneously because mm -hmm. I wasn't used to responding. Yes. Absolutely. Now you've opened us to the discussion of what can young people and older than young people do when they get into a moment where someone has dismissed them or dis disrespected them 
And they, they need to say something so they don't walk away from that moment, carrying it not only for the day, right not only for the week, yeah. but maybe for years. Did any of you have memories of things that happened years ago? Did you feel like you were back there in that situation? Did you, did you ever have a feeling where you saw images of yourself in that time? You saw memory, things started popping up in your head. How many of you, if you said now, if I said now, you wish you had a do-over, you would say something very differently in that moment? Okay. Now, we, we have a sort of prize that we call healthy racial comeback lines. <laughs> and um, obviously some of your stories may not have been racial. They could have been something else. But the idea is... Um, what we found in young people who walk away from those moments without saying something is they feel diminished. What, what uh, Daryl Sue talks about is microaggressions. The research on that is growing. That those microaggressions, intentional or not, it doesn't matter. So if I accidentally or intentionally run over Simone right here with my car, um, it really doesn't matter to her, right, <laughs> that I was unintentionally running over her. She still has doctor bills to pay. The same way we think about these moments. If you walk away being dismissed and disrespected, those things linger with you. They can undermine your sense of self. They can undermine your voice. They can undermine whether you feel smart enough, pretty enough, strong enough to engage in the, the public. Who you choose as your friends, you may think differently. Who could you trust to be your friend? Those things is why we're interested in in these moments. If I just talk to you about racial stuff related to your ideas and values, it won't be important. But if I could say to you, talking to children about race could affect their health for the better, would you think differently? Would you want to say something? And so comeback lines become a place where we get to say, I'm not walking away from this moment, allowing you to reject me. I reject your rejection of me. Now, the thing is, you've got to come up with a, a comeback line that isn't an underreaction, pretending that you minimize the insult, or an overreaction, like you take everybody out. <laughs> Either way, it's not that healthy. Now, in our society, most people go under, but I think increasingly since <laughs> uh, I showed you the Southern Poverty Law Center data, it's increasing that people are going overboard in these reactions to moments. And the question I would have, what do I need to do to get to a healthy comeback line? Which means I have to come up with some unhealthy comeback lines, I think, so that I can eventually get back to one that makes sense. And so we teach young people about how to speak up for themselves in these moments. And do you have a comeback line, would be the question. If somebody, you pick any slur that you don't want to be called, Pick one, and you say to yourself, if someone did that to me right now, would I have a response that was an underreaction or overreaction? You got one? I don't always do it, but I think a response would, could you say that again? Excellent. That's an excellent idea. For some of the students we work with, we, we say a version of that is, excuse me? Yeah. And you can do it with attitude, like, excuse, excuse me? <laughs> you can use your body, you can use parts. However you do it, that gives you, it puts the ball back in the other person's court and gives you time to come up with something a lot more cogent to say <laughs> they're, while they're thinking, right? Um, so we'll come back to this notion of comeback lines, but it's very important. We don't want anybody to walk away from those moments. And sometimes systems won't stand up for you. You won't find systems with affection, particularly. Your teacher won't stand up for you. Police officer won't stand up for you. So you have to be able to have something. And by the time your parent, who was stand up for you, would get to the school, it would be too late. Right, right. And I have one of those parents, I tell you. My mother would show up. Did not want to see her. But I needed something. You need something. Everybody needs something in that moment. So you don't carry that. And I think about that if I, when I was reading... Uh, Martin Luther King's letter to, in the Birmingham jail when he was writing about the southern ministers expecting him to wait to not fight unjust laws, right? He, he goes through the soliloquy around, you know, I can't wait because you don't understand what it's like. I have to do something. I said, and he goes to this place where he has to tell his six-year-old daughter 
Um, you don't know what it's like to have my six-year-old daughter see an advertisement for the local amusement park on TV and have daddy tell her that she can't go. And, and, and because, of, because they don't allow colored people, and, 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 and you don't know what it's like to begin to see the ominous clouds of inferiority start to form in her little mental sky. I think it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, imagery of what it's like to swallow a microaggression. You can see clouds of inferiority start to form in her little mental sky. So part of the rejection moment I think is powerful. And the comeback line is say, I will not allow those clouds. I will not allow those clouds. Mm -hmm. All right. So story number two, we'll come back to this. Let's say your child comes home rushing, scared to death, running from someone chasing them and, uh, who, who assaulted them as a function of their difference. And they were scared to death. They rolled up into the house and they came to you and they expected you to say something or do something. The child could be Young could be older. You, it doesn't have to be about race. It could be about some difference about them, around gender, around sexual orientation, around age. It could be anything. What is it that you're going to say to that child? That's what I want to know. You've got a minute this time. Ready? Go. <laughs> about yourself while you were talking. I'm sorry, I can't, this is not, I'm not focusing on this right now. Um, while you were talking or listening to your partner, what did you notice about yourself? Back to courage. Yes? I felt sort of, I felt helpless and insecure about decisions that I made when in that situation. Mm-hmm. And on a scale of, um, one to ten, how helpless? Um, when talking about your children, I think it's easy to feel pretty helpless, so mm -hmm. seven to eight. Okay, and did you notice um, anywhere in your body? Um, probably my face. Okay, what was your face doing? Pizza. Say it again? I'm sorry. Pizza. Pizza, okay. And did you say anything to yourself while this was happening? Uh, maybe I'll get some suggestions. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Someone else, notice anything about yourself? Yes. Um, I felt resentful that I had to have this conversation and that I have to have this conversation and that the parents of the children who are causing my child harm don't have to have this conversation and don't have to learn these skills. And I felt it in the left quadrant of my liver. <laughs> right. that, that, um, that might be the most detailed I've ever got. I had a fifth grader say, they're like butterflies that fight in my stomach and they're in battle with each other and then they crawl up into my throat and choke me. Wow. But you might have beaten that child. You might have beaten that child. Okay. Um, the benefit of being detailed about where in your body you feel it is that you can relax that part of your body. Some of you know yoga up the wazoo, <laughs> mindfulness up the wazoo, and if you, if, you, if you start a business with wazoo in it, you've got to <laughs> give me some of the money. <laughs> the question is, do you use it in that minute? Can you use it in that moment that you're overwhelmed? Does it work for you to help you come from a 10 to a 7? So you can speak, so you can think, you can access 
knowledge and memory. That's, that's the goal. Um, so thank you for that detail. Anybody else notice something about yourself? Yes. <laughs> Go for it. I was saying when, when she was telling me her story, Hello. I, when, when she was explaining her story and I had said a story that had a different ending and had a different way of responding, I wanted her to know that I really approved and, and like felt that what she, her ending was just as viable even though it had been different than mine. Mm -hmm. So I felt like I, I wanted to like give her some verbal or facial something to let her know that that was, a good, that was true. Mm -hmm. So you were trying to be affirming in the moment. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Very important. But it's interesting, like when she looked down, it made me feel like, oh, I have to work harder because she's not looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get, to get her to feel that. Okay. Were you saying anything to yourself while this was happening? Um, no, I was just trying to listen and, and give her the right signal. Okay. Did you feel it anywhere in your body? If anything, like because when she looked down, I noticed that I like, felt a little tired in my eyes. Because I'm like, oh, I'm trying to look at herself. You know, because I'm trying to like model her behavior. Yes. Like I don't want to look down too. Yeah, you got to go down lower. I guess, <laughs> and look up. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, I think this young lady here. Uh, in in both the exercises, um, one the early one of us as children a long time ago and, and as parents in the second exercise, I felt empathy and respect and I also felt anger. Mm -hmm. Anger, anger to the teachers who didn't know how to handle it. Sure. Who didn't know how to negotiate interracial relationships. Right. Who didn't know how to be sensitive and balanced with children and help them work it out. Yes. And I still see that today. Time. How much anger? Scale of one to ten. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a peanut gallery back there? Yeah, that was a peanut gallery. Okay. <laughs> and uh, where did you feel it in your body? And don't answer. I feel everything in my back, but I felt it in my face and in my eyes. Okay. And uh, did you say anything to yourself while you were going through this? Keep doing the work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. Um, um, so August of 2013, my youngest son Julian was eight, and we were watching television. CNN was on. We weren't really watching it, and it was right after the George Zimmerman trial and the verdict. And on the screen was Trayvon's parents, and they were crying. And he didn't. He had. He didn't understand. He had a thousand questions. Julian, as my youngest, talks all the time. I have to tell him, Julian, please stop talking. You got to get dressed. You know, it's like. He just talks all the time. Um, but he had a thousand questions, and I felt very awkward. I felt overwhelmed. I did not want to talk about it, because I was sad, too. But he was hard to resist. Once your child goes down a particular direction, it's hard. So he wanted, he wanted answers. And um, part of the conversation, I felt, even though I had done a lot of research on this stuff, still felt awkward. And I'll share a little bit of that with you in the moment. Then we'll open up for questions. Thank you. So to end, uh, we wrote a book about parenting, and, and in it was parenting is a lifelong acquaintance with helplessness. Yeah. And you think you got it, but it's not. It changes. And um, there are times when we look at the research on racial socialization, we were focusing on what goes from parent to child, society to child, but now we're saying it's reciprocal. It's not just what parents say to kids, but it's what kids do with parents as well. And there are times in that conversation, just like when you get angry, where you said, why do I have to give this talk? Um, it's a shame that I even have to give this talk. Um, and I lost it in the middle of the conversation. I started to image what would happen if something were happening to him. So I, I projected myself in that moment, and I went into a whole other place, and he pulled me back. But um, these are moments. So there's an African proverb that goes, a lion story will never be known as long as a hunter is the one to tell it. Mm. Yeah. And everybody's story is important. Yeah. Uh, the policeman's story is important. We just want them to be courageously noticing what's going on in that moment, to make better decisions, to see my child like his child or her child. 
right? To see 12 year olds as actually 12 years, not, not 16 or 18. Early mature is still children. So um, I'm going to stop now, and I'm opening it to questions, given the, the time we have. And thank you very much for taking some risks. <clears throat> thank you again for that fantastic talk and the provocations for us to speak with one another. Um, my question is a variation of my earlier comment, and it is, um, the applied version of it is, what is the corollary of that conversation that you had with your son for white parents? Um, so what, what advice, mm -hmm. what are the top three, what are the conversations that they have a choice not to have that they should be having with their parents so that their children not, do not grow up to be the police officers that you have to warn your child about? Because right now, that conversation is completely optional. It's not happening. <laughs> what should it entail? And likewise, what is, is there a body of research being invested in right now that is the corollary of the wonderful coping research that you've developed mm -hmm. that's focused on white families, white teachers, white spaces, to help them gain the skills that we, as, as a matter mm -hmm. of survival, have to gain? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, I, th I think it is a great question. Um, first of all, um, I would say there's, a re there's, a, there's an article that just came out that Ali Michael, uh, Eleanor Bartoli, and myself and um, other colleagues wrote about white racial socialization. And it's, uh, I don't have the reference, but we can, I don't know if you have a website, we can get it to folks. But if you, it, it, it'll be, it's coming out just this last month. And it'll have, it'll be about, it's called, uh, if you look up training for colorblindness. And in, in what Eleanor and Ali did is they interviewed um, 20 white families to, to get at what their views are. And what they found in just a qualitative look is that most of them were thinking of affection, protection, and correction in the context of not talking about race. That not talking about race put their children in better places of safety. Because when you brought it up and it didn't go well, it wouldn't be kind to the other people who are people of color wouldn't be fair, would be unjust, and also might put them at risk if they didn't handle it well. So uh, I think there are different motivations for certain families, but I would argue that if you want your child to be competent in these moments, because they might run into a place in which they have to speak up, that all families and parents could be stressed by that reality and say, I need to tell my child or explain to my child why this is an important conversation. Um, we are doing training in schools with educators from every racial background where we're going to ask them to do the very same things, to do this courageous noticing. But it's going to be practice up the wazoo. So if you, you can't do algebra practice, homework for one night and get the quadratic equation. So you need weeks and weeks and weeks of the practice. And in some schools, we're in mastery schools in Philly, we're in KIPP, we're in uh, TFA. Um, we are. Um, and we have longer periods of time for people to feel much more comfortable at their ability to manage their stress in a racial moment. So, so even if I get stress, I know what to do about it. Right? It's not, there's, I don't see stress as a, at a nine or, a, or this moment as a snake or as the, the one place I have to, just, to show my social justice. Um, so it would be the same strategies to, regardless of, of the parents. The idea is the risk taking is great. right? Um, how do I, as a parent, share with my child a story in which I felt helpless? And this is true for um, all families. Very few families, we find out, really know how to talk to their kids without being overwhelmed. Because many of us protect them from our horror stories. Right? Why? Because we feel like if we tell them, we don't want to burden them with the stuff that we went through, even though they're getting burdened by stuff every day, I think. Um, some people say, well, aren't you, you know, isn't it being racist to talk about this stuff? Or isn't it being, um, what's the word, too scary to throw this on your children? And I say to people, part of the luxurious or few joys we have about parenting is to scare our children to death about certain things. <laughs> and so why is race one of those things we leave out, right? We ask some kids, 
in Chicago Latin School, fifth and sixth graders, do your parents ever say anything scary to you? They say, yes, don't talk to strangers and don't, talk, don't, get, don't take candy from strangers. They said, okay, did anybody, did a stranger ever come to you and, and try to give you candy? He said, no, but we're real prepared for it. <laughs> so the idea that some people believe that talking about this puts them in a particular emotional debility, you know, disability, I think is because we're afraid. And I think we need to share more of our stuff as part of that conversation. I think that's every family. I don't think all of us, because we felt like we didn't want them to go through that, and they need, they need to hear those stories. Uh, uh, just one footnote is that sure. I totally agree that we all go through it, but what I was trying to hint at is that children are also causing one another stress. Absolutely. So that how do you prevent white children from call, causing the racial stressors of their peers? Yeah. How do parents actually work with them to do that? Not yes. Just cope with oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I still think the idea is if you had an incident today, um, calculate, locate, and communicate. You got to say this. What was it like when you were thought of as a perpetrator, if that was the case? What did it feel like? You have to process all of that issues. If we have children, and what we're finding though is when children are able to say what they want to say, you're checkmating some of that superiority. So if someone calls you anywhere, here's what I want you to do. I want you, some kids, when they say, they say, excuse me, or could you repeat yourself? Other kids say, do you know the history of that word? Well, let me give it to you. And they'll talk for two minutes straight and not stop. Now, that child that goes home has got a different lesson. I mean, a story to tell mom or dad about what they did that day. And the children who are watching around, the witnesses, also are going to think very differently about that moment. So perpetrator versus, you know, it's, it's a different story if you, but it's not that different from fighting on street corners or playgrounds. You don't let bullies just walk away, right? You've got to come back with something. And we're saying an emotional place, uh, even those consciously or unconsciously, we were at a school in Chicago, a school where we do some trainings for young people, three hours. The first hour, it was two days after uh, in November of 2015, after a Republican primary. Um, the Mexican students in the first hour were crying because um, they had been prepared, being in the school for years, for the kind of general racial stereotypes about let, being Mexican. After the primary, students in the school, as students naturally do, they take from the media, from the world, and say they co-opted in relationships, just human. They came up with new microaggressions and stereotypes that they were not prepared for because they included, not them personally, they included their grandmothers, their mothers, their brothers. So they were crying the first hour. Second hour, we did comeback lines. Third hour, they were prepared. They were ready to say stuff. And I would say that um, you want parents to be able to, to be honest about, if my child is in a place of privilege, how, what's my voice on that? In our school, we have issues around class. We want, um, I, I told someone at lunch, I want my white colleagues to talk more about class, right? Because there are students who are white in those classrooms who have nobody to speak for them. And my colleagues are trying to fit into an Ivy League wealth structure of whiteness. That's not what they grew up with. Mm. So the white racial socialization, in some respects, has to encapsulate a whole bunch of stories mm -hmm. that allow you to think twice the next time you want to use a stereotype. When you borrow a stereotype against someone else to make yourself feel good, there's a history of that in our culture. And I, as a parent, don't want you to go through that. Because then you're going to feel uh, larger than you ought to. My good friend, Margaret Beale Spencer, has been working on a book called The Downside of Privilege. And her point has been for years, psychologically, that the mental health and health concerns of folks who think they're better than other people are just as detrimental to those who are getting pummeled every day. Because yeah. you've got to prove to people that you're the shit, and you really ain't. <laughs> and when shit falls down, you got to figure out why I'm not all that in a bag of chips. <laughs> I hope I explained that very clearly in <laughs> detail. And the, prob and the problem is, so there's a, there's a reason why everybody should be talking. It might be different because of the positions we have in society, but uh, I would still go calculate, locate, communicate, breathe, exhale. 
I didn't mention breathe and exhale, did I? Oh, that's bad. Courtney, you're supposed to remind me of that. <laughs> Breathing and exhaling are important when you do the calculate, locate, communicate. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, another question? Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. but my comment is for a comeback line. Sure. Uh, as a public educator, uh, my students would say, if somebody said the N-word, is that the best you have? Okay. I like that. Absolutely. Um, we ask young people to come up with a lot of them, like 10. Five unhealthy and five healthy. And they can pick um, anything. And um, so practice all the ones. Now, I don't tell people, I forget to tell people this, is that a comeback line is not something you have to say. It, it just means that if you ever want to say, you'll be practiced enough to say it. Because if you don't have choice in whether to say a comeback line, you're still um, stuck. Um, and some of those young people we get, they react to moments they, because they're not practiced. And we don't want that. <laughs> That's why uh, the more you practice. So the idea is you can come up with one that you choose to say or not say, but you have to practice enough so that it becomes you in a way. So I like that one. It becomes a shield, I think, in some ways, just to have it in your head. Yeah. Our son had long hair during years when that was super not cool mm -hmm. um, in elementary school. And he had, he came up with them on his, he came up with, everybody can hear me, he came up with his, his comeback lines totally on his own. I, mm -hmm. I suggested some mean spirit. He said, no, mommy, I don't want to be mean. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, shit. Yeah. That's good, honey. Yeah. <laughs> Learning again. And he, so he would say, well, Kids would say, "Why do you have long hair? That's for girls." And he would look right out and say, "Well, I'm a boy, and this is my hair." Mm -hmm. And sometimes he would say, "Who decided about your haircut?" <laughs> not, in, and again, not in a mean way. Uh -huh. Who decided about? And it was never the kid; it was always their mom. He's like, "Well, I decided about mine." Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and after a while, nobody said anything because sure. he just. You know, you carry yourself differently. If you know you've got something to say, absolutely, you know, to say it. absolutely. And we, we're calling that a kind of assertiveness, in this case, a racial assertiveness, that um, once you get that sense of yourself, um, the, the quicker you are, the wittier you are, you don't, it doesn't bother you as much. You can keep moving on. You can focus on school. You can focus on, you know, um, yeah, that's a great example. Someone else, question? Not really a question, but more of a statement. It really is important to have like comeback lines. Like I never really thought about that until hearing about it from an educator. Because whenever something happens and you immediately snap back, I snap back a lot mm -hmm. personally. <laughs> but if you have one thing that you can say that will shut everything down, I feel like that would be a lot better than just going on a twenty-minute rant. Like. Yeah. Those people tend to do. Yes, yes. And that, you bring up another element is that if you just use F U or something like that, it's it might help for a little bit, but it's not fully adequate. Because what you really want to say, I don't really appreciate that you keep interrupting me every time I start talking. F U doesn't cover that, right? It might get you into the conversation or get you out of the conversation, but it's not you you want a comeback line to express who you are and what you went through in that moment, um, then you can walk away with your head high. Other questions? Over here. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you can use this, um, expand it to other issues of bullying. Um, I was thinking about Mean Girls and what um, in our school, what we really have is sort of a combination of race, class, mm -hmm. and gender, all you know, combined when they're bullying. It's not just singular. Sure. So I'm wondering, is there a way to help all those other people with it? I would, I would strongly recommend. Yeah, I mean, the question is, where's the insult coming from? Like, which it'd be good to identify what part of the microaggression starts to sting. So to be specific, what you don't like. If, if you're thinking of intersectionality, what about the combination bothers you? What, what about the combination triggers images and memory? So um, you understand we're not just suggesting you go to comeback lines without processing with <laughs> stories. 
Um, you couldn't just borrow someone else. You can borrow comeback lines, but they've got to be meaningful for you. So the process of telling the story of why those different identities matter to you and when someone kicks them, it matters to you, is important to be able to articulate. And that's where parents who are able to share their own stories can help young people share their own stories, right? If you're biracial, but you feel like you want to represent both of your parents, and you feel like you're betraying one over the other, if you hold on to one position, helping someone navigate the tension of that and speak it is a very unique kind of intersectional comeback than, than some other combination. Cool. I'm here? We're about to wrap up? No, no. Yeah, okay. we're going to wrap up. Go ahead. Take your question. Um, I don't know if I have a question, but um, so for me and my experience, it's been a lot of um, microaggressions happening within the classroom mm -hmm. um, or just people talking about race and not knowing how to talk about it. So maybe I'll just tell the story and then I'll go from there. Um, I was in my class and um, two boys, one was um, African American or half Nigerian and the other was white. Um, and they were having a conversation. Um, oh wait, no, he was having, yeah, he was having a conversation about how to pronounce a certain word in Yoruba, which is a Nigerian um, dialect. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm Nigerian, so I, he was pronouncing it wrong, so I corrected him. And his white friend uh, proceeded to whisper very loudly to, for the purpose of trying to get at me, I guess. Um, she's a better black than you. Mm -hmm. um, so in that moment, I turned over to him, and I said, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And he said, OK, I'm racist. And I said, I never called you a racist. I never said those words. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand how that has anything to do with the conversation that I'm having, because I'm talking about a language, an African, a specific country in Africa, a language. And you're talking about being a better black. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. And at that point, I'm shocked, and I don't really know what to do. So I turn back to kind of collect myself, because they want me to react. They want me to pop off. And um, then, what makes it worse, other boys who are also white in the back of the classroom um, proceeded to call my name. And they said, Joanne, and this is the first time they're ever calling my name. Mm -hmm. um, typically, it's purple backpack or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like, typically, in moments of race, you don't call someone a racist. And I said, those words did not come out of my mouth. It's something that he brought into the conversation. And, but I could tell you, you really don't care about this because you're just trying to you know, get at me so you're wasting my time. Mm -hmm. I was so mad. Mm -hmm. And I felt helpless. The scale of one to 10, how mad and how helpless? That was at 10. For both? <laughs> For both. <laughs> and did you feel anywhere in your body? My heart and uh, everywhere, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but. I was mad. I was mad at first that it happened to me. Mm -hmm. But I was more mad that a lot of students deal with this all the time. And it gets overlooked. Mm -hmm. yeah. And nothing's done about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. It can happen to me. Oh, my teacher. Oh, <laughs> oh. Um, so I left the classroom to take a moment. And then I came back and waited for the class to be over. And then um, I went to speak to my teacher about it. And he, I told him about the situation. And he said, there's nothing I can do about it, basically. Because he said, you know, they don't want me to having you know, a strict hand on these, even though yeah. some lame excuse. Yeah. And I said to him, you're allowing this to happen. Because the environment was very laissez-faire. Mm -hmm. There was no structure. So these boys thought they had the power to do whatever they want. Yeah. And to make students feel uncomfortable. And I was the only one who was going to say something about it. Mm. And after that, I was like, I'm not standing for this. So I went to administration. But I'm not satisfied with that because if they're handling it on an individual matter. I'm looking about all the other kids who deal with this on a daily basis. And they feel this way. It impacts them, their mental health, their, their safety in that classroom. I didn't feel safe in that classroom. But I, I know that I have the strength to move forward. 
Mm -hmm. But what about all those other people? So I don't have these, the answers to these questions, right. and I don't know how to deal with these things. And I say to myself, I have to remain to be the change, but what do you do when the institution is not ready for that change? Yeah. And they yeah. see you as a threat. Yeah, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I mean, as you're telling the story, I'm feeling for your pain in having to just speak those words. It took, it took courage to even speak them. Um, and I also let people know that part of the idea of racial socialization and speaking is, is not, um, it's based on the possibility that we could change the world and also that the, the world might not change. So you have to, I think, Consider the possibility that we ha that you're still going to have to take care of yourself and the people you care about, even if other people don't change. And I think that's different than the linear version that we have walking into a sunset for a dream that's going to be just progressive. It's more circular. Sometimes we go back before we go forward. And so you still have to live and be smart and brilliant as you are, even if people won't be nurturing, won't be protective, won't be, hold, be held accountable. And that's a, just a sad reality. And we, we, it's better to cry about that tragedy as opposed to, that's a healthy thing to do, to cry about we live in a world that doesn't really, make, might not change. But that doesn't mean you are lost. Your voice still matters, as you heard today. But we want young people's voices to be public. And in case nobody stands up for you, could you still, you know, stand up? And so, nah, we don't want to envision that world, but it does exist. And um, um, uh, I think it's great the way you you sort of approach your story. Still matters. Have you written it down? Yes. You've written it down. You got to write it down. Because the things that we care about really are things we write down. When we write it down, it means means so much more. We've got to run. Get out of here. Thank you so much for sharing it. I want to thank everyone. Um, we have books.